Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, good evening, everyone. Moin Moin, Hamburg. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is not for making advertisement for the delicious uh, Moritz Fiege beer from Bochum, but it's rather for medical reasons to um, soften my voice. So, oops. So the talk, we can't see anything, can we? Can we put slides on? Beautiful. So, title of my talk is Milking the Digital Cash Cow. This relates to, the, um, to a fairy tale of the Grimm brothers. Uh, the German, there's a gold esel, and if you like say something mean to the gold esel, he shits gold. And I noticed here on the 29C3, if you say to certain girls, you say something mean, you get a red card instead. No gold huh, here. So we are going to milk the digital cash cow. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm coming from Bochum, from the very west of Germany, from the Ruhrpott, where the air is very black because of the coal mines. But if you take the picture from the right direction, the Ruhr University is very beautiful. And right there is um, the Horst Goertz Institute for IT security. That's where I am a researcher in this Heiji I Institute. I'm one out of five, uh, 100 researchers there. And we also have a lot of students, 600 students in IT security. So you can study IT security in Bochum. Very, I can recommend this. You can, you can first do a six, uh, six semester master, uh, bachelor's studies and then after this a master either in uh, information technology or if you went to Fachhochschule or you studied something else before this you can um, make this master in networks and systems or if you're working you can do distance learning yeah, that's, and that's what I am doing so um, I'm now very proud to be in my 27th semester studying electrical engineering and information technology and um, I'm, did a lot of research and in this, um, I'm going to show some of this here. But first of all, so 30 years ago, this is my first computer, yeah, 30 years ago, 1982, I remember it exactly, I was about three years old then, um, this uh, device was first introduced, the Commodore C64, may I ask, who in this room has or has had such a computer? Okay, it's at least more than half, yeah, more than half of the room. Yeah, and it's a very beautiful computer, and because it's the, to celebrate the 30th anniversary of this computer, I have decided that in parallel of my talk, we will play a nice uh, Commodore C64 game. And my favorite uh, Commodore C64 game, which is the game Mafia. Is it known to everyone? Um, it fits uh, quite well to the talk, so we first have to load the game. Mafia. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's not so, it used, we used to have a lot more time for drinking beer while booting the game in the old days, but the floppy, we have a floppy accelerator. <laughs> it's starting, so the game is, uh, this is the beautiful graphics of the Commodore C64, 32 kilobytes of memory. And of course, first, before we start, we should cheat a little bit, so. In line 300, this is the random number generator. And here we give us some more, let's say 30, yeah? So to be, otherwise the game will take ages. So we can start again. Compare a 32 kilobyte of memory to the size of one Microsoft Word file, yeah? So the game starts, how many players? One, it's me, Timo. And now it's about, I get some force, I get some intelligence, brutality, and some start capital. And the game can start. Nice sound we have. And now we can walk through the city. Usually the first thing you do is you go and organize a car. Yeah? Organizing a car. So you go to the car shop. You go inside the car shop. There's another nice graphic. And what you can do in the car shop is you can buy a car or you can organize a car. Of course, we want to organize a car if it's not to be. Okay, but there are too many people here. We can try again. Organize the car. Still too many people, so we go to the next round. Let's assume we have the car now, yeah? Because we don't have so much time. We have to start with a talk soon. So <laughs> let's at least go to Blüten Eddy. Blüten Eddy is very important because you can go there. 
This is Blüten Eddy. He's printing counterfeit money. Yeah, Blüten Eddy, my favorite. But he's, um, you can ask him one to forge a passport. Number one. This is another talk. We are not going to talk about this. Do you still print forged money? Yes, that's what we want. Two. Um, so, how much do we want to invest? Five thousand. And he gives us some counterfeit money. And the cool thing is you can go again and again to Blüten Eddy and again give him his own counterfeit money. And he will <laughs> again return you more and more of, these, of this money. Huh? And this is how, how you have to start with the game. <laughs> okay, but we should not forget uh, the talk, so let's, <laughs> let's <laughs> not play mafia all the time. Huh? So we have seen mafia, it fits very well. And this is maybe mafia 2012. Yeah? So this is the content of the talk. I start with some introduction about wireless devices and such, and then I introduce the topic of side channel analysis, attend a very, very old story, keylock door opener. Some of you might have seen this already on the 25C3 when we presented the whole keylock story here with Thomas. And then come uh, the MyFair Desfire MF3 ICD40. I'm already fluent with the MF3 ICD40. Contact the smart cards, how to extract the secret keys of these secure smart cards. And I, then finally comes the third part, a contactless payment system, probably the worst realization of a contactless payment system ever. Now this, is on the, uh, this is a joint work with Ingo von Maurich, David Oswald and Christoph Paar with my dear colleagues. All right, and uh, this is what my research in the past years was about. So all these embedded wireless devices you will have, uh, you all will have some like this in your pockets like to open, open doors for contactless payments, identification purposes, for ticketing, to open and close your car, for governmental identification, or here these RFID enhanced pacemakers where you, that you can reprogram through the human tissue. Here the attacker model is uh, accelerated heritage, like set the heartbeat of your grandfather to 220 beats per minute. <laughs> this is not part of the talk. So what all these devices need is uh, cryptography. And cryptography, cryptology, <laughs> cryptology they need, the core of all of these. And if you look into cryptology, you have on the one side always the inventor of a cipher who invents some cipher, cryptographer. And on the other side, you have the attacker, the cryptanalyst. Crypt analyst. And uh, the game is that the designer invents something and it's tested here. And if the attackers find some vulnerabilities, they will report it to the designer and he can improve his system. And this is the very important circle how to design a secure system. It's well known in the mathematical world. It's not yet so well known uh, with attend of real world devices. And there's a recent trend that people do such cryptanalysis attend of real world commercial devices. And surprise today on the Curse Communication Congress, we are on the side of the attackers and we do some security analysis here. Um, looking deeper into the field of cryptanalysis, we have to do this here to distinguish what we're doing. We have got the classical cryptanalysis. Classical cryptanalysis works at hand of a mathematical model and abstract description of the cipher or the cryptographic thing you want to analyze. Um, so you can do brute force attacks, given a plain text and a cipher text, try all possible secret keys until you find the correct one. Then you can do protocol attacks, for example, man in the middle attacks. That's the modern way of stealing cars. You have seen these uh, recently in the news, the passive keyless entry systems, how to drive away the car with man in the middle attacks. And then we have the classic uh, mathematical analysis. This is what Nikola Kotwa is doing in the other room currently with the Russian cipher ghost. So really hard mathematics. And we are now on, on the right side of the picture where these, um, say, very secure cryptographic primitive is put into an electronic device. And there we have completely new attack vectors. So you have got it in your, in your smart card, on your mobile. Then you can, um, can do some implementation attacks. For example, active implementation text is fault injection. You, for example, you manipulate uh, the, the power consumption, the, the um, power voltage supply of the device, or you shoot on the circuit with lasers, optical fault injection. You want to induce a fault and then somehow extract the secret key. Uh, or you do re reverse engineering either from software, so you disassemble some code and you look for the secrets in that code. Or as Carsten Moll did years ago with the MyFair Classic chip, you reverse engineer from hardware by taking microscopic pictures. And we are now focusing on the side channel analysis, which is um, a passive, passive type of attack, which means that the device is operating under its normal operating conditions, and we just passively, passively observe it while, while it's doing its normal things. And then we try to conclude to the secret key. 
and uh, I would like to explain this at the end of a, a bank robbery. Yeah? So say you want, you have got this safe here, and you want to open the safe. What you can do is first you can try all possible combinations of this of this lock, do a brute force attack, and you will try for years and years, and you will never open this tresor. But there are different approaches. So let's see how how it is done in Mafia. Back to Mafia. I saved some state because to to. Um, to break into a bank in Mafia, you first have to have a certain criminal status. You first have to be at least Kleiner Fisch. And here I'm already Ganova, so this is a free state. Ganova. So let's go to a bank. I'm going to the bank. It takes some time. The bank is on the left side somewhere beside the supermarket, this white thing there. We're going to the bank. Enjoy the nice graphics while I enjoy a little bit of figure view. Okay, we, we walk inside the bank. Then he says, "Good, good morning, sir. What you, would you like? You have two two options again. The first option is um, this is a bank robbery. And you you directly take the pistol and rob the bank. And the second option is um, just look for alarm systems and come back again in the night to rob the bank. That's what we want to do. Who wants to do the break? That's Timo with his revolver. Now comes the important thing here." Says, hmm, let's see. I want to try it with a stethoscope. Yeah, so we will use a side channel of the of the tresor, the, the side channel of the mechanical lock while turning it in order to find the correct positions of the of the combination locks. So now silence here in the room, because we are going to with the F keys going to break the tresor. Aha. Oh, this was bad. Probably there will be an alarm. Ooh. This was my fault. Okay, no alarm here. Not successful bank robbery. Oh, that's bad. That's bad. Something went wrong. Devil. Oh, that's bad. But I hope the principal. I think there is no time now for this shooting thing. It will take just take too long. <laughs> um, so. Um, I hope the principle, the principle of the side channel attack has become clear. So, the professional thief just takes this stethoscope and listens to the sound of the of the mechanical locks in order to find the correct combination one after another. Yeah, it's like the divide of co and conquer principle that we're using here. And we do, we do exactly the same, just at hand of some electronic device which is performing cryptography. Yeah? For example, here these. Key lock remote controls. They're used to open cars or garages. And if you look inside such a remote control, it possesses a counter. And each time you press on the remote control, the counter is increased by one. And then it's uh, encrypted with a cipher. In this case, the key lock cipher. And the output is then sent to the car. The rolling codes. It's the encrypted counter. And now the car on the other side, it can decrypt this. Um, rolling code and check the counter value and can decide whether it's a valid code or not. I, I'm not going into details here. There's a secret key used for the encryption, of course, and that's what we want to have. And then, of course, um, we know the algorithm and we know the ciphertext. We do not know the plain text. And of course, here a stethoscope is not so useful because we cannot listen to anything, but we will use a uh, digital oscilloscope instead to measure the power consumption and see. We just assume that the device uh, consumes different power when, pro when processing a 1 than when processing a 0. And we measure the power traces, process them on the, on the computer, and finally, if we are lucky, we get out the secret cryptographic key and can then clone the remote controls, for example. That's the idea. And this is um, to give you an impression what it looks like. This is one power trace when you record it, when you press on the remote control, on the, on the right axis the time, on the y axis is the power consumption. The beginning is very easy, so you press on the, on the button and the device starts to operate. The end is also very easy. This is where the rolling code is sent. And now um, the problem is, where is the key lock encryption here? It must be somewhere in between this. Does someone want to have a guess here in the room? Maybe you want to point somewhere? Where would you guess that the key lock encryption is? Oh, no guesses? Yeah, we guessed it would, it would be uh, there on the top. But of course, it was wrong. This is, was the moment when the device writes to the internal EEPROM to store the new counter value. 
and after some more months, uh, that's, this is the, the, the worst part of all of it, we found that the key log is just here, yeah? so the, between 21 microseconds and 24 milliseconds and 24 milliseconds is where the key log takes place, and this is what took the most time for the attack. We simulated the successful power analysis attack long time before, this was no problem, but to do it in practice, this was really hard to find where the key log encryption is. So after, after um, performing these attacks, what is the management summary? You press 10 times on such a remote control and, pr and measure its power consumption, and then you can extract the 64-bit uh, secret key of key log and clone the remote control, which is not very impressive. Then we had another attack, an improved attack. There's a so-called manufacturer key in the key log system. And we can obtain this manufacturer key from only one power measurement without knowing neither the plain text nor the cipher text. That's quite impressive for mathematicians. They can't figure this out still. And this manufacturer key is very important for the, for the key log um, because the keys of each remote control of one manufacturer are derived from this manufacturer key and a serial number of the remote control. So each time I press on the remote control, it sends its serial number and then the rolling code. So if I know the serial number and I know the manufacturer key, then I can clone such remote control from a distance, as was shown here on, the, on German television, Dreisat, years and years ago, it's dinosaurs. But it's still, um, to understand uh, that this is a, a uh, more devastating attack because it leaves no traces. So we come with our car, Professor Pa and me in the car. We park in front of the garage and there comes the victim. And the victim now opens the garage and we eavesdrop this encrypted rolling code. And the e victim is leaving. Of course, she doesn't notice us because we are <laughs> hidden in the car. And now, we, with the help of the manufacturer key, we, we uh, get the secret key of the remote control and produce the next valid counter value in order to open the garage, and then we can walk inside the garage and, for example, put something into the garage, whatever you want to do there. <laughs> yeah, this was years and years ago, and after the attack, there were basically three reactions from the industry. So one reaction was that companies ignored us. That was um, quite often. Then more often were companies that hated us. For example, we made, uh, I got known to the Dachverband of Garagentorhersteller the next day after the first week. <clears throat> yeah, and there were also some uh, companies who helped us, um, who asked us how to improve their products. They said, oh, we have, we have got this key log and we want to have a secure system, so we help them, and they probably have now a very secure system because we helped them with it. This is interesting, but the question is, what does it mean for Mafia? For Mafia 2012, <laughs> if you go to the car machine, there are no more options. So first, in two, you can, you can crack the manufacturer key of one manufacturer, and in three, you can eavesdrop the code and then open the car. But of course, number four is must, the traditional way, way of organizing a car has to be in the list, because compared to the efforts of extracting manufacturer keys and opening a car, the traditional way of just smashing a window, if there is no alarm system present, it's still an option for sure. So this was the very old story key lock, and it was, um, didactically a problem because many people thought that these side channel attacks can only be ap applied to like or mathematically broken ciphers such as key logs. So we, we look for other targets and we found the NXP uh, MyFair Desfire card, which is a contactless smart card. So it does not have any contacts and it uses the triple desk cipher with a 112 bit key. It's widely used for payment, for ticketing, access control, for identification by many companies and other guys. And it has a four kilobyte non-volatile memory. And inside this, you can, you can create something like, a, it's similar to a Linux file system. They're called applications, but it's, each application is rather a folder. And each folder can contain up to 16 files. And then you can give um, access rights on the file level. So for each file, you can say one out of 14 keys for each application what um, you may do with the file. Read it, write it, delete it, anything. And there's also a, quite a master key for each desk file card, which is like for, if you know the master key, you can, for example, format the cards. And it's what used, for example, in San Francisco in the Clipper cards or open cards in Prague or the new Oyster cards. I think they are also using this. Uh, this is what Nicola Cotta just told me. But, uh, I'm not sure about it. 
And when we started with the attack, um, we just we just had this black box. Yeah, we we did not have. You don't get much information about such a product. If you if you would, would wanted to have such information, you would probably have to sign an NDA for 20, 30 years, and this was not part of the plan. So we just uh, knew that if we send something to the card, it is encrypting this value X with a triple dash cipher. We don't even get the output. Yeah, the output is somewhere in inside the car, but we found out it's always encrypting something. Um, the problem here is now that it's a contactless smart card, as I said, so we cannot measure the power consumption directly, but we have to measure the electromagnetic emanation with, with such a near-field probe. Um, and that's uh, and it's an RFID card. That's another problem. So we first need something to communicate with the card, control PC, and to communicate with the desktop card, we use our um, self-built RFID reader, and you can also build it if you like. It's an open source project. There's currently the layout and the schematics. You can build it for less than 40 euros, and it's freely programmable, so you can use it also without the PC, and you can use it for practical tests in the field. Um, this is useful for the communication, and then we have on the other side, we have got the data acquisition. So we've got a near-field probe here, some special digital oscilloscope, a USB oscilloscope. It digitizes the, the, um, the electromagnetic field and then feeds it into the control PC. Yes, and the reader also sends some a trigger signal to start uh, the measurements of the oscilloscope. And now you see already we need a very strong RFID field here to power the DESFIRE card. And we want to measure the very small side channel leakage of the silicon chip which is inside the DESFIRE card. And you can imagine that this side channel leakage is orders of magnitude smaller than this strong field of the RFID reader. So we somehow have to get rid of this strong RFID reader field first in order to conduct some tech. This is a, a power trace that you measure without any special circuitry. What you see is nothing. No? And if you zoom into the power trace, you see some sine wave, and nothing else. Yeah? This is just the field of the RFID reader, but you cannot make any um, you, you cannot see if the device is currently computing something or not. You just see nothing. So that's why we uh, put first a carrier subtractor here. This is just an um, analog circuit that subtracts uh, 30.56 megahertz sine field from the side channel signal we want to acquire. And then it's fed into the oscilloscope. And then we, in the digital domain, after the uh, digitizing, we do uh, what, what many, probably who in the room has built his own AM radio already? Uh -huh. Quite a few. So you, this is exactly the same principle. You just need a diode and a, um, for rectifying and a capacitor as a low-pass filter. We filter at look below 8 megahertz, which is quite a low value. So all information above 8 megahertz is discarded. And after this, you get, some month later, you get uh, something like this. So you already see some information. If you think about it, it's a triple desk, you can receive one, two, three. It might be this might be the triple desk. But to verify it, um, you, you you go through a profiling phase. So you you can of course obtain desk fire cards of which you know the key and we use them for profiling. So they've got the default key when they're delivered from the manufacturer. I don't know FFF or A1, A0, A2, A3, and then you can. Um, make a power analysis on the plain text and on the cipher text. So you can see where the plain text is processed and you can see where the cipher text is processed. And each of these little bumps here is when one byte of the plain text or when one byte of the cipher text is processed. So you can be sure that in between these two um, in time instance, there must be the triple disk encryption. Now, if you look at the time, how long it takes to load one byte of the plain text and how long the triple desk encryption takes, you can also make the assumption that there must be an 8 bit microcontroller inside the card plus an additional triple desk hardware which is assisting the microcontroller. Now, knowing this, you can use another power model for Hamming distance model for the, for the hardware chip and attack the hardware finally. And this also takes again some time. You also get some alignment issues. So this is again zoomed in. So you see these three bumps here, and this is zoomed into the bump. This is the first bump, and you pick one of these bumps to align the traces. If you if you do a differential power analysis attack, you always want all the power traces to be aligned very um, very nicely in order to conduct the attack. And what we do now is we we pick this reference pattern and align all traces with respect to this reference pattern, and we always send the same plain text now send the same plain text and we see the second bump for the second attempt sending the plain text is somewhere else for the third time somewhere else so we are sending the same plain text but the processing time of this device varies 
So um, it, it, it makes the attack more complicated. It's kind of a side channel attack countermeasure, maybe some, some dummy rounds or some timing um, countermeasure. But we also found a way of circumventing this by, with a, you can read this in the appropriate papers, I'm not getting too technical here. And then the current state is that um, we can extract one of these keys. We still need 250,000 traces, which corresponds to a seven hours of measuring time. Of course, the bottleneck here is the communication with the card. You always have to com communicate with the card. That's why it takes so long. And this basically means that you get full access to any MyFi Desfire card, M Desfire MA3 ICD40 card. Um, and this is our lab setup currently, so we just can insert any MyFair Desfair IC, MA3 ICD40 card and let it run for three days and automatically extract all of its keys. And the equipment for this attack is pretty cheap, below 2,000 euros, and it's a non-invasive attack because it's measuring the electromagnetic field, so um, it's, it has quite a high threat potential probably. Taking into account where this card is used, it's quite used for um, Widely for some interesting applications, right? Um, and this was, uh, of course, we we um, this was response to disclosure, and of course, we spoke to the manufacturer long time before we, we publicized this. So in the meantime, the, the Desfire Desfire card was um, discontinued about June 2010, and in the meantime, NXP had a Desfire EV1, some follow-up product on the market. And um, is now selling these cards instead of the MA3 ICD40 uh, death fires. So this is a very good example for this circle I mentioned at the beginning. And yeah, you can analyze a lot of systems that use um, these death fire cards. One example where the death fire card is, is still used is the open card system in Prague. So the Czech Republic has invested 40 million euro for this project. About 500,000 cards are issued there. And it's, it's a multi-application contactless card, so you can use it for the public library. You can also use it for parking in the city center if you need a parking space. And it's also most interestingly used for the public transport. So you can buy a yearly ticket onto your open card, which is already quite uh, a lot of money. And we usually these open cards are personalized, so you fill out a lot of forms with photograph and all your personal data is stored in this. But the data and privacy movement in the Czech Republic has um, has put some pressure on the politicians, and now you can buy also anonymous open cards. But it's quite complicated because you have to fill in a lot of check forms. And but it's possible. And I bought ten of these, and we analyzed them and extracted the master key uh, of one card and of other cards. And this master key is identical for all open cards. This is of course already quite good because you can format any card of these. And we extracted further um, all secret keys of all the applications. <laughs> there. So as I said, one is for the public library, one is for the parking, and one is for the, um, uh, what was it? All right. Um, and some of these vary, and some of them are the same. So we leave some, some um, of the efforts for, uh, to you, and also what to do with the clipper card and so. What we can do currently is access all files on the card, including personal information, and we intend in the year 2013 to maybe find out more of things about this open card system. All right, this, uh, it's time to get to the, to the um, contactless payment system. But first, I want to introduce another nice uh, tool that we have developed, another open source tool. It's a chameleon. It doesn't look like a contactless smart card, but to an RFID reader, it appears like a contactless smart card. Its core is an Atmel ATX Mega microcontroller for five euro. And what it can do currently it is can, it can emulate uh, MyFair Classic cards, it can emulate MyFair Desfire cards, and it can also emulate MyFair Desfire EV1 cards. So all, the, all these cryptographic operations, Crypto1, Stream, Cypher, and the Triple Des, and the AS128 is all implemented, and it's, it's faster even than the original cards. <laughs> and, the, and the advantage is here that this, um, com compared to buying a, an empty card, is that this device can also emulate the unique identifier of the card. So each, if you buy a card, Usually each card has a unique identifier, a unique serial number, and this device can emulate it. So I said it's an open source project. It would be great if people want to contribute or if people would, would also would like to buy it. We also support this, so if there is more requests, we put more efforts in this side. And then next year, there will also be the new mini version of the Chameleon. I can already announce this. So this is then credit card size. It's more easy to hide it in your purse. Bec before this, you always had to wear a sweater and have half of the device in the, in the sweater to pay with it. And now um, this will be small, so it's more easy to hide in the purse. Right. Yeah, one, um, one usage of this um, 
of this uh, Kamel device is this Siemens access control system. It used my classic 1K cards, and the secret keys in this system are the default keys. <laughs> And they use the unique identifier, and, the, and there's something stored in the first uh, block of the first sector. And then, if the UID and uh, the first block of the first sector is correct, then the um, backend will authenticate and give access to some room. So, uh, we did this with Chameleon. This is the system in idle mode. And if you copy the content of one MyFi Classic card to a blank MyFi Classic card, and you hold it there, you see the light is red, you don't get access control. If you use the Chameleon, the light becomes green, and you can just enter the rooms. Very nice. Now, now we finally come to the um, probably worst realization of a contactless payment system ever. So, this is the we called it ID card for employees. So we anonymize anonymize the manufacturer. For years and years, but in this small, trustworthy circle, we can now reveal that this is exactly what is in my student's identity card and many of your student identity cards in Germany and many different universities. What I can do is I can charge this, uh, it's also called Mensa card, yeah? You can buy it in the Mensa in the restaurant of the university and you can charge it with up to 150 euro and you can, um, it's also used for access control to some students' apartments or for paying the washing machine or for copy and print service, all this stuff. Uh, it depends on the university, and according to the manufacturer, Intercard, there is more than one million cards of these in the field with exactly the same configuration. We interacted with the card, and we saw oh, there is my Fair Classic chip inside. And we took again uh, our Alpha D reader, as I said, this open source project. And on this Alpha D reader, we have implemented a very efficient key recovery attack for my Fair Classic, old head. But it ex extracts all 16 keys of the card in less than 10 minutes because this device has a very accurate uh, timing. And the random numbers that are output by the MyFair Classic card are not random, but they are always, you always get exactly the same random nonce because of the timing accuracy of this device. If you use a commercial um, reader, this, it's far more complicated to really fix the, the uh, random nonce of these cards. We tested it on, on the student identity cards. I tested it on my card and on the card of another student and on another student. And they all contain the same secret keys. This is, of course, a very good idea. <laughs> this is an invitation for fraud. Yeah. Very good system design. Yeah. To use my fair classic card and put all the uh, same identical secret keys in all that. Beautiful. So once you have extracted these secret keys, you can just, we, we went this repeated pay and compare approach. So we go paying and we, we look what has changed on the content of the card. You read out the card, what has changed, and we found inside of the card is an additional card number in addition to this unique identifier. And then there is the credit balance. It's just stored in plain without any additional protection. And there's some other data like last pay payment permanent terminal use and so on. And so if you know this, if you know where the credit balance is stored, and if you know the secret keys, then you can now, of course, it's a contactless uh, card. So you can manipulate someone else's card from a distance of, of uh, 10 to 25 centimeters. You just have to get close to the pocket of the victim and do manipulate the card. And one access to reading one sector or writing one sector takes 20 milliseconds. So 20 milliseconds is really quick. It's quite a tech potential here. Yeah, and we did some real world tests, of course. Um, so we, we, we first took these cards. Of course, we did all these real world tests with the permission of the, of the owner here of, of the University of Bochum. Yeah? So I went there, I explained uh, that there are all the, the problems I'm explaining you now, and he was not completely convinced. But then he had got some, some special official member card, which, is, which was used by the employees of the university for open certain doors and all this stuff. And he asked me if this card is also vulnerable. And I had programmed on this RFID area, I had programmed some um, program that lights a green LED. It always write, tries to write 100 euros onto a card, and the green LED will only light up if this was successful. Yeah, so he gave me his card and asked if it's also vulnerable. And I, I just swept it over the antenna. I saw green LEDs on, okay? Gave it back to him and said, there's now 100 euro on your card. It is vulnerable. And he said, this has to be checked. This has to be checked. So we go to the main restaurant to the Mensa, and we go down to the cash desk to my favorite cash lady. 
And um, he said, can you find out how much money is in this guy? And she said, yes, one moment, no problem. And he said, 100 euro. And then the guy was like looking left and right, running out of the men's. I said, Mr. Kaspar, I have understood. We have got a security problem here. <laughs> you can test whatever you like. <laughs> So he said, eat as much as you can, <laughs> test whatever you like. We don't inform the technical assistant. We need to find out what is really going on here. And that's how we, so uh, my whole group, the whole chair of embedded security benefited, of course, from these tests. <laughs> yeah. So what we did is we, we cloned the cards. We, we just bought for 50 euros an empty MyFi Classic card of eBay and made some clones of, of cards that are existing in the system and paid with these cards. This was no problem. And then we just randomly modified the credit balances and paid with this counterfeit money. It was also no problem. What was quite interesting is um, that once you are in this position of the criminal, it's quite exciting. So I gave, gave out these cards to my colleagues in the, in, the, in the chair. And I told them, OK, you go, you hide the card in your purse, because it's white. People will see that it's not the original Mensa card. And then you pay. And please bring the receipt, because we need to protocol how much money, what we have done, so that they can like, get, put the money back in the system. And the first day, they, okay, I guess got two re receipts out of six, <laughs> because they were all so scared. <laughs> The, the heart was beating they, because of being in this criminal position. They all forgot to bring the receipt, <laughs> of course. But then the next day, the next day, I came up to the cafeteria on top of the Mensa, and I saw already five people there with a big ice cream. And <laughs> it, I thought, I also want to have ice cream. And I went to the lady, and I said, I put my, my purse with the cars on the wheeler, and I smiled at her and said, she smiled at me, and I would like one ice cream. And then she said, and now you want the receipt, yeah? <laughs> so because there are five people. <laughs> yeah, there were five people buying ice cream, and they all wanted a receipt for the ice cream. Yeah, we had a good time. We were, after one week, we were already very, very, very fat. We, we also tried to um, produce completely new cards. So you guess a new card number and you put some random money on it, no problem. So nothing in the back end, no effective measures at all. Beautiful. So what the criminal could is hard work. <laughs> Do you see the sweat? <laughs> Sweating. <laughs> Right, what the criminal could do now is, of course, he could sell these cards. Yeah? Of, he could like, dump some cards and then sell it to other poor students, on a t have a top-up service, like pay one euro, get three euro, something like this. But of course, I mean, who is going to do this? No one is going to harm uh, your own institution. You don't want to harm your own university. No one is going to do this, and no one is going to do such fraud. You, you will still get into jail. It's still, if someone would do this, criminal would become rich, but this uh, issuing institution would be bad because people would be paying with money that has never been paid into the system. This would, of course, be a problem, but no one is doing this. You could also emulate uh, cards, if, for example, if you have a chameleon, <laughs> or if you have an NFC-enabled mobile. You can just, on every payment, emulate a new um, Mensa card, and this is of course difficult to track in the back end then, because on every payment you have a new card number and a new credit value, it will be difficult to detect the fraud in the back end. Right, um, then I thought, okay, no one is going to do the fraud, but what about the denial of service attack? So we assume that there is an attacker and he's running around with the reader and he's setting all cards in the field manually to zero euro. Hard work. He could take the reader then our reader and put it in the stand alone mode and hide it somewhere close to the cash desk, for example, <laughs> where the people are queuing and set our cars to zero euro. It's a good idea. This is what the evil attacker would do. But if you think about it, people would just go complain, I have zero euro on my card, and they would um, fix it somehow. And would, what would happen if it's a nice attacker and he charges the card? Let's not say 100 euro, let's say he charges with 23 euro 48. Yeah? then people would not even notice this. And there, would, there might be a lot of people who are not willing to contribute to the attack, but they will contribute because either they will not notice that they have more money on their card, or they just will notice or who will complain if there is more money on the card. So this is the real, really uh, scary attack, I think. The, uh, this is what, on the long term, where they would have to shut down the, the system you know, because people are paying. They're participating in the fraud without um, unwillingly. You know? Yeah, my favorite attack, the cashback attack. So what you can do is you can, you can get an anonymous Mensa card. 
and you go, so you go to the cash desk, you give them 10 euro deposit, and um, then I, I did this, I went to the lady at the cash desk, bought this card and went around the corner and charged it with 50 euros. And then one hour later, I went to another cash desk and I said, okay, I don't need this card anymore. Can you please pay out the money on the card? And yes, it works. So this is the wet dreams of the cryptographers, converting zeros and ones to real cash. Really beautiful. <laughs> Best part. <laughs> yeah, what does it mean for, for mafia then? <laughs> so if you look on the left top, We've got a new M here, where you can walk, and, and this is the Mensa Freddy, and he is now, he is uh, selling my fair Mensa cards. And you have got some new ops here, so it's as, hey, old comedy toner, shall I read cards? And you can say, I am, one is, I am hungry, please load some money on my Mensa card. And the two is, um, do you still have a chameleon kit for me? I have to emulate something. And number three is, <laughs> Um, I need some cash, can you pay out my uh, remaining credit, please? Yeah, and this is the Mensa Freddy. So, if you are a system designer, what's, what's, what can you do? Of course, you all want to, you know this, you all want to use peer-reviewed cryptography, which is ciphers which are known to be good. Of course, you can add some obscurity on top of this. It doesn't harm the thing, yeah? If you want to use some proprietary thing, of course, if, if the core of your application, if it's some good peer-reviewed crypto, okay, go on then, put some obscurity around it. It cannot harm the application end of the day. What you, what you should keep in mind is that what you have seen, physical attacks, for example, side channel attacks, reverse engineering, they're always a potential issue, and that's um, why you have to use certified devices or you have to uh, follow the ongoing security research. So what's the point if you, if you have a microcontroller and you add an AES-256, you, you implement it on this microcontroller and the attacker comes and read, just reads out the program code because there is some, you know, fault injection attack to read out the microcontroller and he gets all your secret keys. What's the point in implementing an AS-256? What if, if someone measures 100 power traces of this microcontroller, you have got AS-256 in the microcontroller and the attacker gets the key. What's the point? So you have to take these physical attacks into account when designing the, uh, the, the system. But these embedded systems, they are only the first line of defense, right? So not unlike in this contactless payment system, you can do something to detect fraud and have a fallback plan in your back end. Like if, if a key is, key is compromised, you should have a mechanism to have, to have another new cryptographic key or, or I don't know, use public key cryptography. There's lots of options. Have shadow accounts for the, for the Mensa card thing. And yeah, one, if you are a system designer, do not educate your attacker. I'm, I'm doing this for, for five or six years now. And what I always experienced, where I always benefited from, is that the companies put some products on the market which are in the first place weak and then need to, need to be upgraded. That are easy. So you can learn a lot already from this, this first um, series of devices that you can attack. And then they improve something on the, in, the, in the second generation of this product. And usually you would not be able to, to break it. But with the knowledge you already got from the first generation of this product, it's, it's an easy step to, to also break this more secure devices. So that's what we saw with the Xilinx FPGAs, for example. Yeah, that's the end of my talk. Um, thank you. So if you want to come to Bochum and study um, IT security, uh, you get food for free. You know, it's a very nice place. <laughs> uh, Yeah, thank you, Timo. So you. I guess there might be some questions. So if you'd like to ask a question, please cue on the microphone. Do you have any question from the internet? There's one question from the internet. You did say you extracted not only keys, but also information from the card. Are the, are the protocols to talk to the card standard? Yeah, the protocols to so talking to the MIFA Classic cards or MIFA Desfile cards, they're standardized, so you can... Um, and they are known on the internet. You can look from the Proxmark sites, and, and in these days you can find these protocols somewhere using Chinese Google or so, google.ca. It's, it's all on the internet in these days. And there are already some devices, uh, like our um, reader, which are implementing the protocols for these MyFi Desfire cards and MyFi Classic cards. Number two, please. Yeah, I got uh, two little questions. Uh, first, uh, the student card was replaced uh, the card, uh, through a Desfire card. 
And uh, I would like to know if you cracked both cards or just the MyFact Plastic card? So it's uh, in, this, in this system, these days they're using, they've upgraded to MyFact Desfire, mm -hmm. but of course all the old MyFact Classic cards, they are still valid and it's still all working. So it's just, when I come there, I always get a special, special me message that the system integrator put there. It says, please uh, greet the customer. And so always if I buy something, they are greeting me and he cannot delete it from the system. He cannot find me anymore, which is a good sign. Looks like there is no link from my name and my matricle number to my Mensa card, which is quite good. Yeah, and, uh, uh, and, and now these upgraded Desfa cards we have not further analyzed because, oh my God, it's our university. <laughs> so, um, and the second card is, uh, uh, the second question is, uh, you said uh, the chameleon, you got a few, uh, so can we buy a few devices here on the uh, C3 or? No, I did not bring. I, sh I, I will do it. I will bring some. I promise. I will bring some some kits to the next uh, to the 30 C3. Um, but currently, I have not brought it. It's just the layout. It's a simple simple layout. You can produce it on your own. It's uh, you on a home cooking. Um, okay. Thank you. Well. The guy number one, please. Uh, you mentioned that it is a bad design to use the same secret for all cards. Uh, I wonder what is the workaround? Would you have to store like the secrets you use for, uh, and remember for ev every serial number of the cards the, the used secrets and store it in the back uh, end systems? Or how would it work to use a, a different secret for every card? Yeah, one, one option is, as they did in the key lock case, we've got this master key, but it's also bad because you also have a single point of failure. And once, once the attacker knows the master key, he knows the other keys. And better option would be something like um, pub, use public key cryptography. No? Then there is a public key in, in the card if you have enough computational capabilities, which is these days possible. There are IFIDs who can do ECC. And, um, and then use public key cryptography. But in, in this case, they use the, the, the cheap MyFair cards. So could they work around it? Like they, they, they would have to build their own. Uh, secret on application layer to work around this. So what they could cards. do is they, they could do some, some way of key derivation and this would of course um, make the attacks of this system uh, by orders of mag magnitude more complicated. The, the current state is you go to someone else's pocket and it has the same secret keys and you just manipulate his card and he didn't even notice. If, if his card would have another secret key, this scenario would not be working anymore. I first would have to break, have access to his cards for 10 minutes to extract the secret keys and afterwards manipulate the content. That's why it would make the attacks a lot more complicated. What, what I do not understand is how does the, the, the legal card reader knows the secret of the, the correct secret of the card? Yeah, so there are um, neither secure access modules who, who can compute keys, like derive keys, or you implement something similar to the, um, to the key lock system where you take the card number, unique identifier of the card, or both. Uh, if you would check the unique identifier, it would also be good. And derive the key of the card from this information using some master key, using some AS or so, or using some hash function, whatever. Yeah. Number two. Um, yeah, you talked about um, that all the cards have the same keys. I am assuming you talk about um, of one in uh, instantiation. Ah, this is okay. for, so for okay. the for the Ruhr University. It is uh, one. Yeah, key. yeah. I, I, I once did a lecture in uh, Hochschule von Rhein Sieg. And yeah. they had different keys. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, again, I checked that. I checked that too. But um, the uh, key, uh, the both key A and B for the first sector are always the same on different universities. It's, uh, are they? But probably because these sectors are used because the no, no, credit th value is stored in. in yeah, they are stored in. And no, but the first sector they put there some proprietary MyFair application directories. Somewhat, they all look the same at different universities. Yeah. But um, always have the same keys. Aha, are you having this business already then? <laughs> no, I uh, haven't a university that um, allowed me to check buying things, but I was at a nearly same stage. <laughs> but nobody allowed me to try it. <laughs> oh, poor. That's bad. For me, it was very good because I got this paper on financial crypto in Tenerife, the beach, yeah, because of the allowed me to do it legally. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to do it. No. <laughs> Okay, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, the guy with the number 54201. Yeah, that's me. Um, you, 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 you said that um, <laughs> uh, the card was used in universities. Um, what were the other uses, like uh, company canteens or? 
Uh, I'm, I'm not, uh, I, I don't really know where, it, it, it's in all the universities and it, it's in some companies like um, big companies where you've also got kind of Mensa and pay there with contactless. Um, but the main use cards. was universities. Main use is, is universities, I think. If you, if you look on the card reader and it says intercard, you have a high chance that it's the similar okay. system. Thank you. Um, okay. Okay. Please. Um, Just one thing. Uh, lots of banks use them to authenticate their personnel and also for payment. Oh. Uh, in so their bad. buildings, because they have like, they don't want the employees to leave the building, so they have like wash machines there, you know, um, lots of lots of lots of lots of things, food stuff, and they pay with it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, what are the defense strategies from the company side to, I mean, we saw Jitter on the power traces, obviously the modern card at Jitter. Are there other strategies they add to? Now this question relates to NXP, to the card manufacturer who is producing now the follow-up product, the Desfai EV1, which is like EAL, I don't know, 4 plus or 5 plus certified. And what they currently do is, if you look at a power trace, you, you saw before that you could see some, like three bumps or so. At least you could see something that the card is doing something. If you look now at a Desfai EV1 card, it just it starts consuming a lot of power. So they are using a, a noise countermeasure in addition. And just the power consumption becomes very, very big. And it becomes quite random and stable. And on the first glance, you cannot you can spot some things, but you cannot see where the encryption is, and you cannot attack the encryption. So I, they, I, don't, I have no clue. <laughs> you have to ask someone from NXP what exactly they put inside. But I guess that they use some masking and hiding and additional some noise, and this will probably be secure for uh, for most most of the applications and for the next few years. It's kind of a <laughs> signal noise ratio. Uh, yeah, yeah. the usual measures are that you do some hiding in the time dimension, mm -hmm. that you add noise, and then on the algorithmic level that you um, put some masking. So you mask all the values with random values. So if you make a power analysis, like you, you cannot see the real values anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay, number two, please. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for the talk. It was awesome. <laughs> Thank you. And You get, a, you get a free free figure beer after the <laughs> you can collect it. <laughs> um, secondly, <clears throat> rather non-technical question. It strikes me that um, if you if you go to to uh, Philips buy such a MyFair thing, then you don't you don't get a a working crypto system, but a, a building blocks to build your own system. So kind of like a Lego set, right? <laughs> so it is up to the the integrators, the integration guys, um, to build their own crypto system. And that ends up with problems, problems like they, they put in the money value. It's, it's just read, readable clear text value and not protecting that um, additionally. Absolutely. And uh, that seems to me like a structural problem. Any, since, since you've got quite a background on this. this uh, um, I think the problem is in all the companies, that's what we also heard today in the morning about the electric uh, locks. Yeah. is that there is a lot of companies who just, they are like a family company who have like 500 uh, workers and they just cannot, um, they, they just don't have a cryptographer in the, in the company oh. and they say, okay, we, need, we want to do something secure and they buy some product and then they say, oh, default key, let's use the default key in all, in all our access control because they think, aha, now it is encrypted. Exactly. So that's why we have the new company, Chaos, Kasper and Oswald, so all the people who need this oh, right. experience, they can come to us and... Uh, so you actually, us. you have a solution for that kind of structural problem. Yeah, <laughs> this is on the right bottom side. Yeah, it's a very new company, only founded two months ago. <laughs> All right, thanks. Thanks for the admitter. You get two figure beer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Number one. Yeah, I've got another question. If you've got um, an RFID card, how do you find out which chip is inside it? So it depends. First of all, RFID is a very wide world. Yes, you have access control 125. Card. Yeah, you can have a 125 kilohertz access control card, or you can have one working on 30.56 megahertz, whatever. So, assume we are in the 30.56 megahertz HF range, then they will all obey most, like 95 percent, will obey the ISO 14443 protocol. And then at the beginning of this protocol, you get some um, you, you answer you get some answer to request. You, yeah, you you. In the protocol step, there is somewhere an ATR, and the card gives you some information. And from this information, there's a, for NXP cards, for example, there's an application node identification of of MyFair cards. And then, according to this ATR, you get you can see what type of card it is. 
So first step is identify the frequency. It's most likely 120 kilohertz or 30.56 megahertz. And then look at the information that gives, uh, the card gives back to you according to the ISO standard. And then there is usually some, uh, by the manufacturer, some documents that if you, or you just buy some commercial reader. There comes a program with a commercial reader. You put the program, or buy this NFC smartphone and get this NFC tool and put the smart card on top of it. It will tell you what smart card it is. If it's not reacting, it's probably a 125 kilohertz smart card, then you have to do the same for the 125 kilohertz domain. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Complicated, no? <laughs> Number four, please. Did I get this, did I get this right? Um, it will take 10 minutes to, um, to, to read out the keys of a completely new card? My fair classic card, is one, one sector key is 30 seconds. Um, uh, with our implementation, 30 seconds for one key. So you put the card there, you wait for 30 seconds, and you have one MyFair Classic key. But this applies to the MyFair Classic. Do not confuse okay. it with the MyFair Desfire card. Mm -hmm. For the MyFair Desfire card, seven hours for one key. Ah, uh, okay, seven hours. Yeah, and, and this is seven hours and 250,000 traces. If you compare this with 10 traces for the key lock remote control, you just needed okay. 10 power traces, and now you need 250,000. It is because of the countermeasures and the disturbing strong RFID readers field. Okay, do you really need those, te those, those seven hours, or could it be that um, if you're lucky, uh, you find a matching key after 10 minutes or 15 or 20? No, that's very unlikely. So usually you will, you will need these some hours for it. It's an uh, average value, seven hours. Um, but uh, these attacks can still be improved, like you can do template attacks and all these things. Okay. Uh, but it's in general sufficient if you have one card, you, you can borrow it for a while and extract the key. I need only one card and then, okay, I see. So okay. you can put any card into this yeah. lab setup, you press on play and then you go away Wait. and you work. <laughs> and after okay. three days you come back uh, and you have all the keys, all the applications, all the keys and all the content of, of this desfire card. Thank you. You're welcome. Number two, please. Um, have you tried this with other Mensa cards from other universities? No, only uh, so, um, yes, <laughs> <laughs> but not officially. I think <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I only, I only, I think I only read out the cards. But okay. I, I guess I never went uh, eating for free. Okay, I, <laughs> <laughs> I got an inter card here. Is it just the same? Yeah, I think this is the, what's the name of this manufacturer who sells the readers or so. Or maybe who sets this um, the system? Yeah. Maybe it's a good. Maybe you are on the lucky side. So. <laughs> but be careful, yeah. That's, that's the one step to jail. Uh, just an addition for him. Um, in Magdeburg, it's also possible. We have the Mafia Classic and the new Desfire, and the Classic is of course uh, here flawed. It, it's you can get free food. <laughs> no one is hungry. Good. Good news from Magdeburg. Number one. Yeah. Do you know whether it would be possible for the card manufacturers to just uh, put in a little white noise generator into the IC and uh, just put white noise on the antenna whenever it's doing cryptography so that it just blocks out all your side channel uh, signals? Yeah, this, this relates to the question we had before here, what countermeasures can the, can the manufacturers put into the car? So the, the thing you mentioned, just produce a lot of noise, is one of these countermeasures. But in the end of the day, if you add noise it, for the attacker, it just means you need more measurements. Yeah? If, if you then acquire two or three million measurements, you will still be able to get the card. So you, you need to find a compromise between the different countermeasures, which is appropriate for a system. And you will come to some point where you say, no, this it now takes one year and uh, 10 million traces. Now my card is secure enough. I mean, if the, the white noise would be like 40 decibels above the side uh, channel, you would have a real hard time seeing any signal in there, even if you have so many samples. No, I would say the white noise just averages out on the long term. So if, if you average over this white noise again and again and again, it will become zero. And only the side channel leakage will remain. <laughs> that's, that's the, that's, we can talk about this offline. I can explain you how these attacks are right then. Okay, thank you all. Thank you, Timo, for the thank you. great talk. Uh, great audience. <laughs>